When encountering authorities in your daily life, you might not give much thought to where that authority comes from. As a child, you might have inquired, but adults aren't in the business of delivering thoughtful, cogent rationale for the legitimacy of authority. It's far more likely that you were told, because that's how it is, because I said so, or some similar non-answer. Early societies, and a few outliers today, believe that this power to govern comes top-down, top being the big G in the sky. Democratic societies derive their power from consent, the idea that the people choose their leaders. Symbolism, icons, and insignia might give us some insight into the stories that we tell ourselves about these sources of power. Perhaps we can find a more honest answer hiding in plain sight to the question, why should I listen to you? But the top-down, bottom-up duality isn't really a strong enough dying. We need to further split these symbols into three conceptual camps if we are to understand their intended meaning. Legacy, wealth, and violence. This is a recreation of the Roman Empire's Vexillium of the Emperor, not an exact parallel to modern national flags of today, but a prominent symbol of Rome still recognized today. It features an eagle standing on a red banner with a wreath just like the one worn by Caesar, with the letters SPQR, Senatus Populus Q Romanus, which translates as the Senate and the people of Rome. Today, SPQL can be found on St. George's Hall in Liverpool, and SPQH is embossed on Hamburg's Rattais. And those two are by no means the only example of this little meme. The second part of our red banner is a laurel wreath made from interwoven leaves of the bay laurel plant, which was worn by emperors to signify their imperial authority. As is the Roman way, they hijacked this idea from the Greeks, specifically the Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne, where the laurel symbolized an unrequited love. Apollo fell in love with Daphne, a nymph who did not feel the same way about him. So she transformed into a laurel tree as an escape, and as a way to cope with his grief, Apollo took some leaves from the laurel tree and crafted a crown. Millennia later, this weird little symbol of sexual harassment can be seen on luxury goods, national flags, and as a prominent symbol representing diplomatic power. While we have some examples in front of us, let's also look at crowns. It's incredibly common to find crowns as family crests and coat of arms. These, for example, are just the countries that start with the letter M that use a coat of arms featuring a crown. It's also a favorite of brands that are desperate for you to know that they're the best in town, they're the bee's knees, they're the literal king. Before we get back to our vexillium, let's just deal with the elephant in the room. Not that one. That one. The lion also appears prominently in Judeo-Christian symbolism. Lions are absolutely everywhere in heraldry, from Africa to the Philippines, and of course all the way up and down Europe. The lion is the king of the symbols. If you haven't been able to take your eyes off the Philippines, yes, that is exactly what you think it is. A rare but literal symbol of American imperialism. Lastly, on the Roman Vexillium, let's have a look at the most flagrantly ripped off aspect what the Romans called the Aquila. Look at all those chickens! Birds, particularly birds of prey, are ubiquitous in both heraldry and vexillology. You know that saying Rome wasn't built in a day? Well, neither was it broken down. Rather than a single defining point of failure, the Roman Empire slowly dwindled over centuries, first splitting into two empires, the Western Empire with Rome as its capital, and the Eastern Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, with its capital Istanbul, Constantinople. Over 80 years, the Roman Empire endured attacks from the Huns externally and the Gothic peoples from within. The Western Empire shrunk over time until barbarian king Odiosa took Rome from the 16-year-old Romulus Augustus, who would become the last emperor in Rome, though he did get to live and even get a pension, and that's better than most hostile takeovers today. The Senate did not see Odiosa as a legitimate ruler, and so transferred the seal of Rome to Constantinople, making the city that we call Istanbul the Second Rome. 
Following the collapse of the Western Empire in the late 5th century, Constantinople remained the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. At the same time, the Catholic Church had just started to gain traction, but would spread throughout Europe, gaining power and influence. Even princes and kings would answer to the Catholic Church, a church that saw themselves as the only legitimate gateway to the authority of God. This idea of being the gateway to the ultimate authority created one of the most complex and interesting empires in European history. From Denmark to Italy, France to Poland, the Holy Roman Empire was a 1,000 year long collection of thousands of different entities into a single dense area about half the size of mainland United States. In 800 CE, Charlemagne was crowned King of the Romans, in part because the Byzantine throne had been taken over by a woman, Irene of Athens, who killed her own son to take power. But it was the being a woman part that the popes weren't happy with, not the murdering. There's evidence that the pope would give certain families the right to use the Roman eagle within their crest. Throughout the complicated, chaotic history of what Voltaire called the not holy, not Roman empire, one symbol remained, a black eagle that the Germans call the Reichsadler, the German imperial eagle. A gorget. It'll make sense, I promise. Just go with me here. A gorget is the name of a single piece of armor that hangs from a soldier's neck. Its name comes from the French word gorge or throat. Gorgets were originally elements of medieval metal armor that a knight would wear to protect his throat from sharp pointy devices. But in the 17th century, gorgets mutated from a practical piece of armor to a decorative element that denoted rank. This vestigial nod to medieval knights was equipped by many armies, including Swedish, French, and British. The one on the far right is actually a young Colonel George Washington. Speaking of far right, the Nazis were obsessed with legacy. You can see this in their flamboyant use of black letter font and ornate decoration. And so they brought gorgets back in the form of this boomerang shaped metal bib. If you were living in Nazi Germany, you would most likely encounter a gorget on the chest of a military or SS police officer who became more and more insecure and severe towards their own people as the war went on. In fact, German civilians described these officers as Kettenhunde, meaning chained dog. Not great. Peter, on the other hand, was great. At least his name was, but nothing great lasts forever, and so when he died in 1725, a will surfaced that was to be read, not just to his direct heirs, but to all subsequent heirs. The will had a clear directive for Russia. Take Constantinople. Now, the will itself turned out to be a forgery commissioned by Napoleon to heighten fears of Roman aggression, but it was well known that Russia was obsessed with Constantinople. In tales popular in 6th century Moscow, it is said that Rus people would take Constantinople and their king would become the ruler of what they called the City of Seven Hills. The use of the double-headed eagle as a Russian coat of arms goes back at least to the 15th century. With the fall of Constantinople and the end of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, the Grand Dukes of Muscovy came to see themselves as the successors of the Byzantine heritage. A heritage which included domination of areas of Turkey previously controlled by the Hittites, who also happened to use an eagle prominently in their symbolism. This idea that Moscow was the successor to Constantinople was later reinforced by the marriage of Byzantine princess Sophia Peleolog to Russian Tsar Ivan III. It's kind of hiding in plain sight. They call their kings Tsars, a direct derivative of the Latin Caesar. Here is Tsar Nicholas II with his cousin England's King George V. Which one is which? It's impossible to tell. His other cousin, Wilhelm, the one with big chicken on his head, was the German Emperor. The German Emperors called themselves Kaiser, another word translating directly from Caesar. This divide between the Holy Roman Empire and the Third Rome, the two competing stories about what Rome became, is not just one of empire, but of church. The Tsars were crowned by the Eastern Orthodox Church, while the emperors in the Holy Roman Empire were anointed by the Roman Catholic Church. Russia and Germany are not alone. Many European nations, including Spain, Italy, Greece, and Poland, all have as part of their law or traditions the idea that they are the heirs to the Roman Empire. The Greek or Roman eagle and the Hittite eagle are not the only two origins of birds as a symbol of authority. The Korashi hawk, for example, 
is a prominent emblem amongst Arab nations today due to its legacy as a powerful symbol within Islam. According to popular interpretation, the Quran condoned falconry. The falcon was also said to have been used by Muhammad as a clan symbol. This is why you might have come across stories of Arab princes who insist that their falcons need to fly with them. Sounds like they've got a little bit too much. Money. Seals. No. See, no seals. Whether on a ring used to enclose a letter or decorating the halls of a government building, seals are perhaps the most persistent symbol of authority. And to tell the story, we can finally break out of our Roman rigmarole. If you could wish for one object to appear before you, might I recommend China's heirloom seal of the realm. Given that later seals, far less rare, and far less valuable, have gone for millions of dollars. You're likely to make a Bezosian fortune at auction, and it so happens that there is more than one country that tells itself it is the real China, and so the bidding would be fierce. The Jade Seal was commissioned by China's first emperor, Qin Zhu Huang, uniting China in 221 BCE. This seal was carved out of a legendary piece of jade called the He Se Bi. This original piece of jade was itself considered so valuable that Qin Zhihuan's great-grandfather had originally tried to buy it off the Zhao state for the low, low price of 15 cities. Inscribed upon the seal of the words, having received the mandate of heaven, may the emperor lead a long and prosperous life. A tradition was born that throughout China's tumultuous multi-millennia history, the seal would be passed down to the new emperor, and the jade seal, like so many others, evolved from a practical object to a ceremonial symbol of authority. Most scholars agree that the imperial seal was lost when the last emperor of the Tang dynasty, Li Kong, took his family and bodyguards into a tower and set it on fire. A bit traumatic, no? There is a story that years later, during the Song dynasty, a farmer working the field happened upon the jade seal in the ground. The farmer presented it to the central government, but it was later lost during the Ming Dynasty. Although the original seal was lost, each subsequent dynasty would commission a seal, many of which are still around today, and can be seen on bond certificates all the way up until the Communist Revolution. While we're talking about seals, let's dispute a myth around the symbolism on the one dollar bill. Despite what has become a widely believed conspiracy theory, the all-seeing eye depicted on the bill is not associated with the Illuminati, but is a symbol used to represent the all-seeing eye of God by many groups, including the Freemasons. The Freemasons have worked hard the last few decades to open up to the world, becoming more inclusive and less secretive. They use the square and compass symbol with the G representing the architect, effectively a generic term for whichever deity each member believes in. Many of America's founding fathers were Masons, including George Washington, Ben Franklin, Paul Revere, John Hancock, and Chief Justice John Marshall. Freemasons account for about nine of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, as well as a third of those that signed the US Constitution. Masonic symbolism is intentionally cryptic and complex given their historic secrecy, and features a wide array of symbols, many of which have origins outside of the order. Now it must be said that for the most part the Freemasons, the Lions, the Rotary Clubs, these are all primarily social clubs that do a lot of good charity work. They are by no means the spooky puppet masters of the world they're often made out to be. On a totally unrelated note, Apple is currently the most valuable brand in the known universe. But if you were to take Apple, Google's parent company Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, aka Meta, aka come on Zuck, just write it off, it's not gonna happen, and combine their wealth with 15 other massive businesses, the smallest of them being Tesla, you would come to a total net value of 7.9 trillion US dollars. What if I were to tell you that there was one company that a few hundred years ago had the same value of all of these businesses combined, and that company was Dick's Sporting Goods. No, sorry, that was the Dutch East India Company. Colonizing, plundering, and enslaving, Verenigde Oostindische Company, or the Dutch East India Company, was an unmatched power in its day. They traded in spices, silk, porcelain, metal, livestock, tea, grain, rice, soybeans, sugarcane, wine, coffee, and enslaved people. 
The Dutch gave the company quasi-governmental powers, allowing it to establish colonies abroad, negotiate treaties, and even mint its own coin. The VOC went bankrupt around the turn of the 1800s, but to this day its legacy can be gleaned from architecture and artifacts from Cape Town to Jakarta. But of course no colonial trading company or government simply won over the hearts and minds of their new subjects with gold and stories alone. They would have to use... There is one nation whose bird-based crest has come to dominate the symbolic landscape of the Western world. One nation who are also, without a doubt, the undisputed champions of romanticizing the Romans. In person, Washington DC is awe-inspiring. The white marble, the Roman columns, and the extravagant ornamentations all give you a sense of the gravitas, of the seat of power for the world's most influential nation. Of course, they bring their own modern take on things with heavy use of stars and stripes, circular seals in contrast to the shields of Europe. But if you look closely, you might see one symbol that is absolutely everywhere. Fasces. Three guesses where this one comes from. That's right, it's, it's Madagascar. No, it's, it's Rome. It's Roman. In ancient Rome, it represented the authority of magistrates to dole out corporal or even capital punishment. It's a bundle of wooden rods lashed together and would often include an axe, except when they were within the Pomerium, Rome's inner city, where the axes would be taken out, symbolizing that the power to enact capital punishment laid with the people of Rome and not with any one man. The more of these fasci carrying assistants the magistrates had in his posse, the more important he was. The image has survived as a representation of magisterial or collective power, law, and governance, the strength of unity, and whether intentionally or not, as a symbol of a group's monopoly on violence. It's worth pointing out that although both the fascis and the swastika were used by Axis powers during World War II, in the Western zeitgeist, the fascis has managed to somewhat be redeemed, remaining a symbol of power and authority in many countries, while the swastika is still banned in Germany today. Despite the swastika being a powerful symbol of luck in Hinduism and symbolizing the auspicious footprints of the Buddha. Once you know about the fascis, you start to see it everywhere. And the same could be said for this little guy. The Phrygian cap was a symbol the Romans appropriated from the Greeks. Come on Romans, have you never had an original idea? Oh, never mind. If you were a slave in late Republican Rome and you had the good fortune to be freed by your owner, you may be given, as a parting gift, a very silly little hat called a pillium. This would grant you not only personal liberty, but also libertas, freedom as citizens. You could even vote if you were male, of course. The British colonies, eager to fight for their freedom from the British crown, would take on the symbol of a floppy red hat. Governments, particularly in the Americas, remained fond of using the symbol on seals and flags as a reminder of their own well-earned libertas. Although this is arguably a heartwarming positive symbol of freedom, its use in the French Revolution does add a darker subtext, to the effect of, if you come for our freedom, you're likely to get what the French revolutionaries called the patriotic haircut. Some nations are less subtle about their symbols of liberation. From the Maasai shields and spears on the Kenyan flag, to the machetes on Angola's flag, to the flag of Oman, who, like in Europe, adopted a royal family crest as their national emblem featuring two cross swords. And of course, infamously, the flag of Mozambique featuring a Kalashnikov. Let's finish off by talking about one symbol that has already appeared on screen dozens of times so far. A symbol that's become synonymous with both law enforcement and the occult. Early societies saw the sign of the star as having magical qualities, and anyone that wore that symbol could protect others or ward off evil influences. Some quick definitions. A pentagram, sometimes known as a pentalpha, pentangle, or star pentagon, is a regular five-pointed star polygon formed from the diagonal line segments of a convex, or simple or non-self-intersecting regular pentagon. Drawing a circle around the five points creates a similar symbol referred to as the pentacle, which is used widely by Wiccans and in paganism. 
or as a sign of life and connections. The word pentagram refers only to the five-pointed star, not the surrounding circle of the pentacle. Pentagrams are widely used by many different groups, countries, cultures, and religions, and it's difficult to define succinctly. For instance, the city of Nagasaki, yes, that Nagasaki, used it because it represents an origami crane. Nagasaki is also known as the Port of Cranes. In Ethiopia, it represents the different races and their unity. In Morocco, it represents the Seal of Solomon, an Islamic symbol. And Wicca has gained such popularity that the US Veterans Affairs allows you to use the pentacle on a tombstone if you are a US vet. Of course, they haven't extended this invitation to the Church of Satan just yet. Now, we're far more likely to run into stars on the badges of law enforcement or on medals and decorations given to military personnel. Early in the history, American states used the star symbol to denote authority and to convey a sense of justice to the people. The seven-pointed star seems to have first appeared in San Francisco. The seven-point star seems to have first appeared in San Francisco. The seven points were decided on to represent the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Virtue, divinity, prudence, fortitude, honor, glory, and praising God. Although a six or five-pointed star is more common among police services from around the world. Symbols, like any form of language, are prone to evolution and changing perspectives. My main takeaways from looking at all of these different symbols from stories around the world is that every mark made by an authority story. As Yuval Noah Harari points out in his book Species, large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common myths. Any large-scale human corporation, whether a modern state, a medieval church, an ancient city, or an archaic tribe, is rooted in common myths that exist only in people's collective imagination. Symbols are an explicit manifestation of these myths. And if we intend to change the myths by which we organize and cooperate, we might want to start with the symbols that we use. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Have a great day.